this uh, you guys are gonna have a uh, you guys are gonna have a great experience. Um, I've, Trevor, I've seen you play. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm a LaSalle grad, uh, okay. but I'll, I'll welcome you nonetheless uh, into this basketball family. But uh, coach, thanks for setting us up. This is a cool thing, and it's good to see everybody. Okay, so we're gonna dive right in. There will be some chance at the back end to ask questions. So guys, he's one of you. He lived in Maples Hall. Um, he, he, he went to war in the same gym that you go to war in, uh, obviously had intense friendships. His closest friends today were teammates he had at Ursinus. So please, this should be part of a conversation to learn from Dennis, but I have some prompts that I'm gonna start it off with. So uh, let's make the first one nice and easy. Dennis, tell us a favorite story of your Ursinus career. Favorite story? Um... I would probably say that that junior year, as Coach alluded to, was a special year. Uh, it was the first, you know, we won the, the, the championship that year, um, went undefeated in the league, and it was just a, a special team uh, held together by great leaders, but also selfless, selfless players that were fierce competitors, which was really cool about it. We would kill each other in the in the preseason, in the off season, and during the season, uh, but ultimately the, the chemistry led to a successful team. Um, and there's so many stories from that year. And, and as coach alluded to, those are some of my best friends. We're still fiercely competitive. It just looks a little differently now. Now it's like Saturday morning Peloton rides uh, <laughs> with each other. Uh, but, you know, that year we went to Florida. A lot of you guys go to Florida. And um, it's always a fun trip. And we always play really good teams. And that year in particular, we got done our two games and we went out and we had a good time um, before we came back. And uh, we stayed out a little bit too late. Um, and uh, I'll never forget, you know, we uh, a bunch of us slept in. I was one of the ones who slept in. And I was not really a social person, uh, but but definitely was social uh, at that trip. And coach, our coaching staff was comprised of, like, coaches' buddies that were awesome guys back then. And Coach Pat Boyce, he came in to uh, – I was staying with Joe Scholes, who was a freshman. He came in and he grabbed me in the bed and said – who the F do you think you are? And basically threw my, you know, threw all my stuff in the bag and we ran on the bus. Thankfully I was not the last one on the bus, but the last person on the bus was 19 minutes late. So coach is mad, you know, he's, he's very upset. We know we're, we have a good team. We know we're gonna have a special season, but obviously there's a standard, you know, one of the standards is, is be on time and be respectful. We, we were, we, did, we lacked both of them. We were disrespectful and we weren't on time. So we get, and, and also Ted Piazza, who some of you guys know, um, he gets on the bus with with a Disney hat, um, you know, like I guess that they give out at Disney World, uh, Magic Kingdom, whatever it's called. And, you know, when he got on, Coach looked, just looked at him, didn't say anything, and Ted took the hat off right away. But we fly back home, we get in the locker room, we're wondering what's gonna happen, what's gonna be the consequence. Coach said, go get your bricks. And we had to run 1917s with the bricks because the last person was 19 minutes late. Um, and I look back at that time and, Although we were disrespectful and it was a bad decision, uh, in those moments, I, I love those moments because, you know, A, you get a good sweat in, you get a good work in, but, you know, those are the, the moments that you remember. Although we were negligent in our duties uh, of living up to the standard, it was something that you experienced together. We never forget that moment, you know, and then we ran off 20 games in a row after that, won the championship and just had a really special year. Um, and those are the things that all of you guys will remember. You know, the championships and the winning and stuff like that is really fun. Um, but it's the stuff outside of the game, the relationships and things like that you, that you will have and you will cultivate uh, throughout the course of your time at Ursinus and, and long after. You know, I'm 2004. I can't. I just turned 38 yesterday. I cannot believe how old I am. But um, you know, th those things live on for a long time. So it's really cool. That's pretty cool. I, I, what I remember, I will add to that story. I, I will keep. I'll box up some of the inappropriate behavior. We won't address that. But one, Teddy not only had that hat on, but he had one shoe. We're at, the air, we're at the airport, okay? So, uh, uh, but I remember Irv, kind of your your close friend, there was a, a, a year older, a very close friend, Steve Erfel, um, who was our captain, kind of coming up to me when we landed in Philadelphia and be like, hey, and just try to have small talk to see how upset I was. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, get the fuck away from me. So the entire team knew something was coming. Uh, but what I really remember from that story, Dennis, is actually what happened while you guys were running. It wasn't 17s. This was not punitive. There was some repercussion. They were liners. We were, I remember, we were running for an hour at Bricks. At like the seventh liner, I began to worry about health and regret the decision. Uh, and Dan Luciano was trying to cheat the number. 
I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. And point Steve Erfel, that's why that team became well led because there was an accountability. He started yelling at him that we had not run 11, we'd run 10, and that he needed to knock it off. Do you remember that? Yep. Yeah. And the reason why Ted had one shoe on is he lost a shoe the night before in a fountain outside the hotel. So, yeah. 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 Not a good uh, let's talk a little bit about um, you guys have a long tradition of teasing me once you graduate. For my first six, eight years, I didn't know that this went on and I was a little bit oblivious to it, but they were called smallisms. And now, even guys that didn't play for me, like Keith Hack, who you guys, many of you know, and Justin Klingman, they would walk behind me recruiting, jotting stuff down on their phones to remember to mock me later for, right? Uh, uh, what was one of your favorite Coach Small uh, stories? Um, I got a bunch. Um, I don't know where to start. Maybe I'll start where I started. And I, I went to Dickinson my freshman year and um, had an up and down freshman year. As, as most of you know, so, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a tough transition, but I would start some games and score a bunch of points. And then if you can imagine this, I played JV basketball at the Division Three level. I don't, I don't even know if they still have that. So it was an up and down freshman year. So long story short, I transferred to, uh, or signed us. But before I transfer, I, I go in. I'll never forget the first time I met Coach Small. He was in like this temporary office because there was construction going on. My mom and I go to the office and we meet Coach Small and his assistant, Coach Rula, which, you know, I'm all fired up. I think I can play because the only time I've ever seen Coach Small before this was when we beat them when I was at Dickinson. We beat or sign us. Um, I didn't have much to do with that victory. but. Uh, he said to me, he goes, you know, you could come here and try out. You know, I can't guarantee a spot for you. You come here and try out and, uh, you know, s see how it works out. You know, if you work hard, there might be a spot for you. And, you know, that's a funny story, but it also is something that made me work and me and push me as hard as I possibly could. Um, and another funny small sto smally story that comes to mind is we played my s junior year, Hunter College, from New York City. They were a good team. And, um I was struggling that game, and it was the second half. I had like two points, and I got a steal, which didn't happen often, and I was going in for a fast break. And, um, you know, I didn't play a ton of defense, um, but but when I got the steal. Dennis, you're preemptively cutting off to make the stories favor you. Uh, all right, so go ahead. You, you get a steal. Go ahead. I get a steal. And um, – I was uh, going in for a fast break. I've never dunked in my life in a game. I've dunked a couple times at practice during winter break. So I'm, there's no, I have no business trying to dunk this basketball. And I jump off two feet and I lean in and the rim's here and the ball's here. And I kind of pin the ball up against the rim and I fall backwards, literally fall on my back. And um, the ball gets kicked by a kid from the other team that goes out of bounds. Coach Small calls a timeout. We get to the huddle and he grabs both of my arms and he goes, what the F are you doing? Um, and, you know, great advice there. I don't know what the hell I was thinking there going up for that dunk, uh, but I never tried to dunk again. I never even tried to dunk again at practice. Um, but, you know, he definitely held me accountable in that moment. Um, and I got time for one more story. This is my sophomore year. We were bad. We were 8 and 16. And one of our major deficiencies was defense. And Coach and I have talked about this when I was coaching because he was trying everything to get us to play defense. And one day – we walk into the locker room before a game, and there's a huge five-gallon bucket, okay? And it's got a towel over it. And, you know, we're not just going to let that sit there. So we look under there. And we're like, what the heck is this guy going to do? He comes in. Before he goes to the scout, he goes into that bucket, and he puts his head down. And we're all looking at each other. I'm not saying he just puts his head down and pops back up. He puts his head down. He's, his head is under that water, immersed for a minute. We're looking at each other like, this dude, he's going to freeze or something. And then he pops out and it's like, and he says, that's how you need to play defense. Like it's your last breath on earth. <laughs> um, so, and uh, we, we ended up letting up, I think, 84 points that night. But um, <laughs> it wasn't a great thing. But, uh, you know, all those stories were a lot of fun. And I think it provided a venue. For me, it provided a venue where I could be successful. I could feel confident playing the game of basketball. And uh, it was a great time to maximize talents because there was accountability, but also there was the, the fun element. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was a good venue for me to, to play college hoops. So, George, Lucas, what do you think? Should we be pulling out a big bucket of water for, uh, for next winter? Because God knows we need a way to kind of incentivize playing defense. Uh, so I, 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 I want to make it crystal clear that there was no physical interaction with Dennis at that time out. 
Uh, it may have felt like I grabbed both shoulders, but I never physically touched him. I might have said, what the hell are you doing? Uh, 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 okay, so let's let's move on then. You're, you're segueing into skills that you took away. Um, what are some of the things, the talents, the skills, the tools that you learned playing basketball or scientists that have been helpful, you know, uh, uh, as you went about being successful in life, whether that was teaching, whether that's being a director of athletics, you know, give some situations today that you find yourself using things you learned when you played at our sinus. Can you still hear me, Coach? I think I'm frozen. You're, you're coming in and out. Yeah, I, I can hear you guys, but everything, the whole screen frozen. Okay. Well, we can hear you. Did you hear my question? Okay. Yeah, I heard your question. Um, so maybe it'll, it'll click back in. Um, so we talked about the skills and talents that I would use today. Is that correct, Coach? Correct. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is passion. You know, like um, Coach obviously talks about it a lot. And, you know, I think a lot of people talk about it, but I wasn't really sure what it was, you know, when I was growing up as a high school uh, player and as a college student. And, you know, he used to use quotes. I'm sure he still uses quotes. Um, and the Henry David Thoreau quote of suck out all the marrow of life, you know, live life to the core. And, um, you know, find something that you love to do and be relentless in that. And I think those words of wisdom and advice uh, time and time again, because I remember junior, senior, I'd come in his office and I would say, hey, you know, I don't know what to do as far as when I'm done playing basketball. Um, and, you know, he would, I would say, you know, I might, might want to work with my dad, who's an electrician. And he would say, do you really want to do that? And I would say, no, I don't. And I would name some other things. And he said, do you really want to do that? And, and most of the time, it would always go back to basketball, it would go back to teaching, and it would go back to coaching. You know, and I think so much of our society puts us in a position where, you know, you go to high, you go to high school, you go to college, and then you get a job, and you stay in that trajectory, that linear path for 30 years. You know, what coach forced me to do is really find something that I love to do. And, you know, it took me a while. I love being an athletic director. I love working with kids. I love running a camp. But, like, I had a bunch of jobs before that, playing professional basketball, teaching, coaching, running around. Like, and, you know, we call it the, embracing the squiggle. So instead of that linear path of a career where you graduate and you get a job for 30, I kind of bounced around, but I embraced that squiggle all along in order to find the passion and find something that I love to do. So, I think a lot about that, um, you know, throughout the course of my time at Ursinus, and that's something that that I always that I always remember. And the other one, you know, would be being a man for others. You know, obviously, Coach talks about it a lot. You know, from Jesuit education, the Jesuit philosophy of putting others before yourself, and it's something that, you know, as a family person with three kids and a wife, it's something that I constantly work on that I'm never going to perfect. Uh, but it's definitely something that I learned at her sinus and something that, you know, I take with me in everything that I do, both professionally, personally, family, all that. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. How about, um, you know, what you guys haven't heard is the narrative of where Dennis had this erratic career at Dickinson his freshman year where he's playing JV. And he's not a very good talent evaluator. If I'm telling a guy who went on to be the best player in the country, or you can try out for the team, right? But there's some legitimacy to the fact of where he was to where he left our community. That was a change that was self-made. You know, we may have pointed him in a direction here or there, uh, me, Joe Rulich, Pat Boyce, some of his early coaches, but at the end of the day, a drive, a perseverance, and you, no doubt all of you are watching The Last Dance like I am, some of that kind of Jordan tenacity uh, that epitomized your career, Dennis. You you were truly self-made. Maybe you can share with us, since we're about to enter the teeth of our transformative off-season. We're just about done school. Our incoming freshmen are, are, are about to be done. And it's time to get to work on making sure we look different for our season next year. What are some things, advice you might have for us so that we can help transform our own career, our, our own games, and be a better team next winter? Absolutely. Can you hear me now? Yep. I left and came back. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing that I love about basketball is that anybody can be good at this game. Like, you could be a freak athlete that jumps out of the gym and you could stink at basketball. You could be really strong and you could be a bad basketball player. This game, it's a meritocracy and the merit is based on skills. You got to be able to dribble and you got to be able to shoot. And there's no such thing as a born shooter. There's no such thing as a born dribbler. Um, you have to pound at your craft. And I think for, for all of you, um, 
because my kids run in here. But for all of you, the, the journey is going to be a little bit different and that path is going to be a little bit different. And I think that all of you are very close. And here's what I mean by that. Every single one of you plays like in a summer league. Every single one of you goes to the gym. Every single one of you works out. Every single one of you devotes time to your game and to getting better. My challenge to you is that you do, just do a little bit more. Like you don't need to be in the gym four hours a day or three hours a day, but it has to be focused practice of what you do. And that, that's one thing that when I look back at my time, you know, at her sinus and playing overseas, I always placed an emphasis on individual improvement. And what I would do is very simple. It wasn't what I was doing, it was how I was doing it, though. I would do a, the spin shooting workout that Coach probably shows you guys. I could send you the video if you want to do it. It's one hour a day. I would shoot the ball 500 times, and I would shoot game shots at game speed from game spots. So I would always be moving as fast as I can, shooting game shots and taking breaks at the foul line. That would be my only break. And that would just be one hour, okay? So if we were playing a series game or if we had practice, I made sure that I did that before practice each and every day. So, like, by the time everyone was coming to the gym to practice, I would change out my shirt and be ready for practice. Or a series game, I'd have a different shirt on because I'd already be dripping, soaking wet. And what I mean by that is, like, all of you are working. You're devoting some time to your game. And you would not be at this point. You wouldn't be on this call if you haven't devoted a ton of time to your game. My challenge to you is just to make sure you understand it's not so much what you do, it's how you do it. Like, you've got to find a time to shoot 400, 500 shots a day, six days a week. And you kind of have to be obsessive about it. And you kind of have to be, um, you know, like, I'm anxious. Before, if I don't, if I wasn't getting shots up, I was anxious throughout the course of the day. Like I needed to get that done. So every day you go to sleep, you know you put that work in as far as how you're becoming a better dribbler and a better shooter. And obviously adding in strength and conditioning and pickup and things like that. Um, there's no secret to it, and you guys know that. Like, there's nothing I'm going to say to you that's going to make you make you work harder or, or find the, the, the time to work harder. You just have to make that commitment. And this is a wonderful time to do it. Like, I know it sounds crazy, but like during this quarantine, people are going to walk out of this quarantine being able to shoot the basketball because they're not playing pickup, they're not playing five on five, and, and there's no excuse for anyone not to be shooting the ball 500 times a day and pounding the heck out of it a thousand times a day during this quarantine because um there's nothing else to do there's no other five on five or anything like that um so that's a long-winded answer but I, I think the biggest thing is is you've already made a ton of commitment just find a way to make a more like a commitment to emphasizing what you need to get better at in a, in a really small, small amount of time 60 minutes a day but it's got to be really purposeful it's got to be hard so um that's a great great leaping off point to also talk about teams um, when you arrived, I mean, your, your sophomore year, your first year at your sinus, that was, it was a team that did not see tons of success. And he told us, he just hit, if you guys were listening, he said we had eight wins. The next year we were ranked in the top 10 nationally, ended up in the top four because we're a one seed and we're undefeated in league. What do you think changed? Because obviously we're still really good your senior year. What were some of the commonalities that are part of a more successful team? Yeah, I think, you know, I look at those two teams and I look at that transition, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing would be there was infectious accountability. So, um, you know, I thought we worked hard my sophomore year, um, but I don't think it was top to bottom, one to 14, all 14 players. Uh, you know, that, that 13 and 14, I should say that the 10th to 14th best players on any team truly drive culture. Like you have your, your two leaders that are really important or three leaders that are really important. But like those players from 10 to 14 drive culture because in all of our life, we have, we have two options in pretty much everything we do. We have an option whether we're gonna embrace that role or we're gonna sulk and be upset with that role. And when I say embrace the role, I don't mean like clapping all the time and, and cheering on your teammates at all time. What I mean by that is you're doing those things. Like when you're on the bench during a game, like you're doing those things. But um, in embracing that role, if you are the ninth to 13th best player, you're fighting like hell every single day to beat that next person out. And I never felt like that junior year, um, you know, I never felt like that job was secure. Like I averaged 20 a game, but like there was Lake and Popola beat the heck out of me at practice every single day. And like he was, he was competitive about it, you know? So I think that it was a player led team, you know, coach, you provided the venue for our leaders to, to really lead that team. But there was like this infectious accountability where all 12, 13, however many people on that team, pushed each other towards one goal. And I think when you find that infectious accountability, you know what it feels like 
Um, and it's hard to replicate that, but it's the job of, of the leaders, but also those players that, that aren't playing the minutes that they want to play. Like, how do you embrace that role? Because you've got two decisions. And I guarantee if you choose the decision to sulk and blame the coach or blame whatever, you know, I'm better than this guy, you're not going to have an enjoyable season, and you will definitely not max out your talent as a person and as a player. So at the risk of embarrassing all the return guys that are on the call, what is a great intro for you, Bo, and you, Trevor, we were interviewing for, for another assistant coach, right? And Coach Van Gorder and Coach Rafferty heard me say, in 20 years, we had the most organic, player-led, and strongest culture we've had. And the one area we want to try to address is to add in a little bit more iron sharpens iron. And so it's interesting because I didn't prep Coach Stanton to have these answers, but you're getting at something that really successful teams have the kind of locked in connectedness that you guys had last year. I, we've never ever in my time in 30 years coaching had a team that had that like you guys had it last year. It was a joy. You genuinely always put the team first. You always cared the right way. Now we need to make sure that we take that and add in this kind of compulsive competitiveness. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, and I'm hopeful that with some direction, also listen to the voice of somebody who's obviously had tons of success in Coach Stanton, that we can add that. Let's talk a little bit about what does Ursinus basketball, what does UCMB mean to you, Dan? Yeah, I think um, I think the biggest thing for me, like when I first think of it, it's the best, it's the best, I have the best memories of my life in the context of basketball. And I was blessed to be able to play overseas and, and have some great experiences and meet some great people. But the experience that I had at Ursinus was a uh, was an awesome experience. I met my best friends uh, that, that uh, who I still hang out with today, and all the in all those moments. But it was Ursinus basketball also provided a venue for me to grow as a young man. And coach, you know this as well as anyone. Like you know, I was uh, immature. I think I was finding who I was, uh, which I'm still trying to figure out today. Um, and or sinus basketball and the program provided that venue for me to grow as a, as a young man to, to not care what other people think. That was a big thing. Like I, I think I desperately care what other people thought about me when I probably entered college. And it put me in a space where, you know, I could grind at my craft, work at my craft and still have those relationships. I think I was very, you know, um, ton I had a lot of tunnel vision. Like I'm going to work my tail off in the classroom and I'm going to be the best basketball player in the country. But there was all these other, emotional intelligence and social intelligence skills that I needed to learn where I was really blocking that out for the first two years of my career. But the Ursinus basketball program and coaches mentorship allowed me to do both, like to really grind at the craft, but also grow as a young man and figure out like how to talk to people, figure out how to run a business, figure out how to raise kids and have a family. All those things were truly grounded in that experience. And, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. So we talked quite a bit when, when, when we were kind of guiding you, Dennis, all those years ago, but even this past year, we, we talk a lot about leadership. And we try to frame leadership in all the many different wrinkles of gray. Do you have a sense of what you think are the most important characteristics of positive leadership? Because we talk a lot about negative leadership too, but like, what do you think are some of the really important characteristics of a leader, of a good leader? Sure. You know, I think, 95% of leaders in high school and college are lead by example. And you hear it all the time. I'm a lead by example guy. Like if you're leading by example and you are truly the leader of the team, it's not enough. Um, you know, lead, every single person on this call should work really hard, should uh, grind at their craft, should be a good teammate, should be positive. Like you, everyone should be leading by example. You're, you're not going to get recruited if, if you weren't leading by example. So that next step is having the conviction to do what we talked about earlier, that infectious accountability. So the four tenets that we always talk about at Souter, and the first thing is skillfulness. Like you have to have competence at what you're trying to lead. And all of you have that. Like you wouldn't gotten recruited if you don't have that the skillfulness. The second thing is is going all in. So what I mean by that is, and everyone talks about it and, and teams talk about it, coaches talk about it, like to give every fiber of your being into becoming the best basketball player possible. Like so all your energy, all your effort, and, and giving everything you possibly can. And the one thing that holds people back from doing that is that they care what people think. They care what people think. So here's what, here's what happens, ready? It happens in, in academics too. They don't want to give everything they possibly can and still be the seventh best player, right? They don't want to give everything they possibly can and still not start, okay? Because they don't want to say, oh, th this guy works really hard, but he still doesn't play in the game. So we care what other people think. 
the best leaders don't give a shit what other people think. All right. Um, and it happens in academics too. Like, you know, someone that's not really good at math, they get a C plus. So they look back and say, well, I'm not really good at math. So I only gave about 80%. You know, you got to go all in as a leader. And the other two things would be um, humility. Okay. Humility. And this is so important because you guys are all very successful basketball players and we all have an ego. My ego comes out all the time. I tell our coaches, your ego is going to come out. When it does, you better be prepared when it comes out. But as a leader, if you want to elicit followership, genuine followership, you know, you have to demonstrate humility. You can't be a know-it-all. You have to uh, elicit input from your constituents and the people that are following you. Um, so always have that in the back of your mind. Like, and it's kind of this double-edged sword because as a leader, I'm telling you to be skillful and competent and have confidence, but you have to have humility too. It's somewhat of a dichotomy that when it blends together, it's a special leader. Um, and the last one is servant leadership that all of you guys have heard before. The best leaders put the people on the same playing field or put them above. Okay, those are the best leaders that, you know, you lost the last dance. Jordan said, I wasn't asking anyone to do anything that I wasn't doing myself. Um, so serving others, constantly serving others. Like there is the hierarchy, like I'm the captain, I'm the leader, I'm the coach, and the kids are, and the players are down here. That doesn't work. Like that model is archaic and it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, skillfulness, going all in, not caring what people think, humility. And then obviously, you know, the last one is servant leadership, just serving others. Those are the, that's another long winded answer, but we talk about this a ton in my, in my job. Yeah. And well, obviously we talk a lot about it too. And, uh, by the time you're a junior and senior, you're, you're, you're being leaned on pretty heavily in our basketball family, as you remember, uh, to have a real footprint, but really that's for all of us, you know, oh, Trevor, you guys need to participate in leadership this year. Right. Uh, because all the things that Coach Santon just listed, every member, including Katie and Emily, should be part of making this a special thing about servant leadership, about putting other people before yourself, all those characteristics. OK, uh, I got one last one and then I'll open the, you know, the floor. Dan, anything else you want to share with the group? But my last question is, I did a podcast a week ago for Coach Stanton. Um, you know, I, I looked on, on his podcast, all these, you know, he's getting hundreds of hits. I think two people listened to my podcast. So obviously I was not. I was, you haven't kidding. posted it yet. We're letting it marinate. We haven't posted it. You never posted it? All right. Well, there you go. So, so no, what we were we, we, of the two. Yours um, will be posted in a couple months. So, so he asked and put me on the spot for a Mount Rushmore, and I kind of copped out. Do you have a Mount Rushmore versus Sinus basketball players? Yeah, I would say uh, definitely start with uh, Nick Shattuck, uh, obviously, you know, one of the greatest uh, ever to play. And uh, Trevor Wall, that's another LaSalle guy. Um, I don't know if you're still on this call. Maybe you're the T there, but that's another LaSalle guy. Nick Shattuck, he did everything. Uh, he could shoot, he could run, he could pass, he could dribble. He scored in so many different ways. He rebounded the basketball, he had massive hands. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to watch him play in high school and then obviously in college as well. Um, second guy, point guard, best point guard in history of the school, Mike McGarvey. A lot of you guys know him. He's the head coach at Lycoming. and you guys beat up on him this year. We killed him for that. Um, Mike McGarvey made everybody better. Um, you know, it's one of the great things about a point guard is to, to make other players better. Uh, I scored a ton of ass. I scored a lot of points at our sinus, and I owe a lot of it to Mike McGarvey. He pushed the ball up, you know, for someone that could really handle it. If the ball wasn't in his hands a lot. We always pushed the basketball up. He made one move, got a guy on his hip, passed it or shot or scored. He was a terrific, um, terrific point guard. Third person I would say is – I didn't get a chance to play with him, but I played against him, Richie Barrett. When I was a freshman, he was a senior, freak athlete, um, just really bouncy, could make threes, could dunk, could run. Much like myself, I, I chired about my defense, but I, if you look at scouting reports, you put me against the best player every single time. Uh, but Richie it was, was a game. We had no choice. You're a dreadful defender. Pull the scouting reports out. Um, and then let me get a big guy in there. Uh, Dan Luciano, coach talked about him earlier. He was a – he did not belong in Division Three. Six nine, uh, could make threes. Uh, he was just carved, sculpted. Like his body was ridiculous. Uh, he rebounded. You know, he's a 20 and 10 guy, all American. Uh, he was a senior when I was a junior. Um, you know, I talked about confidence, so I'll definitely put myself on the Mount Rushmore um, as to to get the fifth the fifth player out there. Raph, don't record that one, but yeah, 
There's only four. <laughs> four I don't know why you're adding you as 45. a fifth. Forty-five is different. <laughs> <when you're laughs> <at that. laughs> uh, okay, I, I open the floor up. Um, some great advice in the last half hour. Uh, incredibly grateful for your thoughts, Dennis. Um, what are some questions that you might have, uh, guys, uh, for Dan? Take advantage of the fact that as we go through this speaker series and we're going to be learning from different people, Dennis is you. You know, he, he's a guy who played here, was part of this, and is still back around the, our team often. So um, take advantage of a couple minutes here if you've got questions or even just want to hear some great stories. Uh, I have a quick question. Um... So back when you were alluding to that time when you guys were running those 19, um, you know, uh, liners, I guess you could call them, um, and, and Steve Erfel's, uh kind of leadership there, I think that's huge in terms of accountability. And I think the key for our season um, is exactly like Coach was saying, um, having that drive and competitiveness amongst each other just to kind of push each other to be better um so i guess my question is um now that we are quarantined and you know we can be working to do different things to improve our, our game um once we get back on campus I know that Bruce and George um, and Packer, all these older guys want to have that kind of a season, but um, how, how, what's the healthiest way to go about pushing each other in a way that's, you know, still family, um, like from experience, what would you uh, say? Well articulated, great question. Um, you know, everything starts with a relationship. So, you know, with those guys that you mentioned, those guys that you know can do it and that want to do it, how do you get everybody on board with that? Um, as a leader, you know, coach talked about positive leadership. So the biggest thing that you need to do first is forge that relationship, that individual relationship with each member of your team so that when you're in that moment, that tough moment when you're in the trenches and you got to call out that player because you can't be a lead by example leader if you want to be a great leader. you got to be able to push kids. you got to be able to push your teammates and hold them accountable. If you've already built up that cachet and built up that relationship, and it doesn't start in September, like all summer long, text, FaceTime, call on the guys to build that relationship. You know, even with these freshmen, by the time they get to the campus, they've already logged hours with you as a leader. So um, the easiest leadership model for me was that, you know, I was a nice person. I had great relationships with every single teammate, even though I, I shot, the hell, shot the ball a lot. Um, but when I would hold someone accountable, they knew I was serious. And I had this strong rock of a relationship with each and every one of them that it was grounded in respect. So it didn't come off as me being a jerk, you know. And um, so it's a really good question, but it starts with those individual relationships. Um, and then that gets extended to that that whole that whole piece, you know. Um, and it starts when you get back to campus with, with the pickup games. How can you make them competitive? How can you make them serious? How can you, you know, want to rip someone's head off to win that game? All those little moments add up to you know, January 1, January 15th, when it's a tough practice, it, it makes it a whole lot easier to lead in that moment. You know, I, Lucas, I think it's really getting at something that Dennis, one of the things I remember about some of those early teams that we've had recently is the capacity to also leave it on the court. And you watch the last dance and you hear these stories of Jordan being just prickly and like snark. It was all left on the court. So there has to be some sense of also saying, this is how we're going to do this. And we also have to be like, there's no drama. We're not we're not lugging the drama to Wismer with us after practice, after a series game. We're not lugging it back to Maples Hall. We're all big boys. We know why we want to do this. We're pushing each other. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, fair point, Dan? 100%. You know, I think that goes back to the individual relationship. So if you butted heads with your teammate on that day or a group of teammates, whatever it might be, um, one thing I would love all of you all of you remember two things when it comes to just that conversation is the first thing, if you put off that conversation, the recipient, your teammate's gonna fill it in with negativity. Like there's so many times where like you're done playing, you're done hooping, and you were a jerk to him or whatever it may have been, and you don't say anything in that moment, and then you bring it to Wismer, bring it to Maples or whatever. When you put that off, your teammate fills it in with negativity. And that happens in sport, business, life, marriage, trust me. I don't put those conversations off. I never go to bed mad. I try not to. Um, so if you put that conversation off, they're going to fill it in with negativity. 
Um, you know, and, and the second piece is, like I said before, um, if it's grounded in positive and, and you want what's best for that person, ultimately you're going to get them to the finish line uh, because they understand your intent. And when you're, you're delivering tough news, like I always tell my coaches or anyone, if you're delivering bad news or something somebody doesn't want to hear, let them be upset with what you're talking about, but don't let them be upset with the delivery. Like, you know, if you're delivering any type of things that that, that recipient doesn't want to hear, they can be upset with the content that they're not getting it done. They're not rebounding, but we don't want them to be upset with the way we delivered it.